I want to talk about what is for me one of the most motivating symbols of the temple. It is always at the back of my mind. It is kind of my life's mission. It is why I do what I do almost on a daily basis. It is a reminder of what my life is for, the purpose of why I'm here and what should I be doing. Lest I forget, I always keep this symbol with me. And I want to invite you to see it in a way that you've never seen it before so that it becomes a motivating factor for you that you can think about and look at that symbol, especially in the temple, right before you enter the Father's presence and you know, now I'm going to report on what I've done regarding that symbol. It will motivate you. It'll change your life. Now, the symbol I want to eventually get to is the symbol of a book containing names sitting on an altar. Now you think about that, a book containing names sitting on an altar. That is a symbol. It is one of the last things I do before I report to the Father, before I face the Father. And I kind of see this as an accounting. I'm going to go account to the Father. He's going to embrace me and welcome me, but I'm going to account for that book of names that I am presenting to him on the altar. Now, to really get to it, we've got to step back. So allow me a little leeway to, to take a lengthy approach to get to the symbol, and it'll have a little bit more meaning. So I want to start with something that is repeated frequently in the scriptures and every single time you attend the temple. I remind you that the Lord emphasizes through repetition. We know what's important to him by repetition. He will clearly make sure his doctrine is known through repetition. And that's how he waves his arm. Our scriptures don't come pre-marked. That would be nice if they came to us already marked to know which verses are most important to Heavenly Father. Not all scripture is of equal worth. And the way we know which verses are most important to him is that he repeats them. Now, one story that has been repeated, probably more than any story I can think of in the scriptures, the most repeated story would therefore have a very significant emphasis and message from him. I am speaking of the story of the creation. Think of all of the times you have heard the story of the creation. Every time you attend the presentation of the endowment, we hear another time repeated the story of the creation. You find it in Genesis, you find it in Moses, you find it in Abraham. You find it referenced all throughout all of the scriptures. Why do we need the story of the creation? Well, let me begin with a beautiful quotation from Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith once said, I have a key by which I understand the scriptures. I inquire, what was the question which drew out the answer or caused Jesus to utter the parable, for example, but applies to a lot more than just parables in the New Testament. Joseph's key is, what was the question for which this is the Lord's given answer? So let me ask you, what is the question for which the story of the creation is the answer? If we don't understand the question, we're not going to understand the answer. And may I suggest to you that so many people assume that the question is how? How did you create the earth? That is not the question. To understand the question, we have to go before the story of the creation. Now, I would submit to you that there is a lost chapter of the Bible. The first chapter of the Bible is missing. If you look at the Joseph Smith translation for Genesis, which we call the book of Moses, our Bible begins, Genesis chapter 1, is actually Moses chapter 2. So in the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis, what is the standard beginning of the Bible is actually the second chapter, not the first. Moses chapter 1, I would submit to you, 
is the lost first chapter of the Bible, restored again in our day and put in its proper place. In fact, Moses was told that. If you look towards the very end of Moses chapter 1, the Lord told Moses in verse 41, in a day when the children of men shall esteem my words as naught, and take many of them from the book which thou shalt write, behold, I will raise up another like unto thee, and they shall be had again among the children of men. In other words, Moses, this chapter is going to be taken from the book that you're going to write. But I will call on Joseph Smith in the latter days, and they will be had again. So let's turn to the missing first chapter of the Bible, Moses chapter 1, and find the question for which the story of the creation is the answer. And that is in verse 30. Watch how Moses asks the question for which the answer is the story of the creation as given in Moses 2. It came to pass that Moses called upon God saying, Tell me, I pray thee, why are these things so? And by what thou madest them? That's the question. That is a very, very different question. He didn't ask, how'd you make the earth? Show me how the earth was made. This is not how the Lord is trying to answer. The question is why? Why is there an earth? Why did you make this earth? That's a very, very different question. I invite you, the next time you go to the temple and every time you go thereafter, before you hear the story of the creation of the earth, you silently ask yourself the question, Heavenly Father, why'd you make the earth? Why is there an earth? And you listen carefully as he tries to answer the question of why, not how, why. So let's take a look at the six creative periods. And again, they're just creative periods. He's not explaining how he created the earth or how long it took. That's not his point. He's simply explaining why. So let's look at the six creative periods and see if we can hear him answering the question, why did you make the earth? So this is Moses chapter two, and I'm gonna zoom out a little bit wider and then come in so that you can see that we've broken it down into the different creative periods. Verses two through five, is the first day. Now let's just summarize what he did on the first day. This scripture, Moses chapter two, is gonna use the word light. He gave light, let there be light. Now most of us are thinking photons, light switch. You know, light as opposed to, I can't see in the darkness, so let's turn the lights on. But I would suggest to you that there are some very significant synonyms that he gives us in the Doctrine and Covenants that we could replace the word light with and add meaning to what he did on day one. Look at this verse in section 88 briefly. Verse 13, the light which is in all things, which giveth life to all things, which is the law by which all things are governed. I would suggest we could interchange those words, that what God brought to this planet on day one, what Jehovah did on day one, is he brought life to the planet. It is now a living thing. He brought light and life and law. And now it runs according to law. It obeys a law. And it's gonna obey him because it now has life and law. So, so Jehovah brings to life a planet. Now in reporting back, in assessing their work, what does Jehovah say of it? What does the Father say? What does everyone say of the work of bringing life and light and law to a planet? We brought a planet to life. And what word do they all use to assess their work? Not the Father alone saying it to the Son, but all of them use what word to describe their work of that day? Good. It was good. 
Think of all the words he didn't use. Now, I don't mean to be facetious. Allow me to be a little dramatic for a second to make my point. Good is the word you use when your child scribbles out on a piece of paper a picture and shows it to you. Oh, that's so good. Even then I said, so good. But if you're writing a paper, when I was in college and I was writing and I put a lot of time and effort into a paper and I turned it in and the teacher had written, if my professor had written good, I would have been a little concerned. I'm not going for good. Good seems to be, at least in a college paper, good seems to be, okay, you did the job. It's, it's, it's fine. It's good. Check. You completed the assignment. But not outstanding, not incredible. This was phenomenal. It's good. And I would suggest, back to creation, None of them, Jehovah, the Father, none of them are, are downplaying. They're not saying it was not well made. I think this is answering the question about why did you make the earth? The answer here is it's good. As if he's saying, okay, check, now move on. I think he's revealing that the purpose of this earth, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you in just a minute. This is not it. There's something else. I did this as a step to what I really wanted to do. Do you see that good? It's good. Okay. It meets our needs. This planet meets our needs for the purpose for which we are creating it. Now let's get to that purpose. So move on. Check. We have an earth that's alive. I think that word good is a commentary on the fact that this is not it. We're moving towards what I'm trying to show you is the purpose for creating it. Now, again, day two, it becomes pretty clear why we've made this earth. He seems to be saying, look, I need food. I need plants. I need to produce food. So I need water. Day two is about the water cycle. Let's separate land and water. Let's get the water flowing so I can water the earth. Because plants and food are going to need that water. My children are going to need that water. So let's get the water cycling. So he separates land and water. He gets the whole water cycle. It gets rain happening and rivers, snow in the winter. Well, we don't have winter, but we'll get to that. But we've got the water cycle going. He is watering the earth for something. And what's his assessment of day two? If you look, verses 6 through 10 is day two, and what is his assessment of day two? It was good. I'm watering the earth. The earth is now capable of something else because we've got the water cycle going. Again, don't you see him just saying, check? My purpose, I'm going to show you my purpose, but it's coming. This isn't it. Check. Rain, rivers, oceans, water cycle. They're good. They're ready for my main purpose. Now we start to get a little bit closer. Day three is where we start to plant food. Crops are going into the earth. We're going to grow food. Now, let me step out and get to kind of application. How many of us are obsessed with food? We live to eat. If that's the Heavenly Father's purposes, then this would kind of be the culmination. This is the reason he created the earth. So it would bring forth all sorts of wonderful things to eat. But when he plants the food and there's fruit and trees and herbs and vegetables and all the wonderful things, corn on the cob, apples, strawberries, all the wonderful things that we eat. What is his assessment? What does Jehovah say of the work that he did? What does the Father say? What is their assessment of the earth's ability to feed us? It was good. That is not his purpose. 
His purpose is something else. And this is a necessary step. I needed water so that I could grow crops. I could grow fruits and vegetables. I could grow food. But my purpose is coming. This is good. All of this, all of this is good. But keep going. Do you see that? Check the box. He's revealing why the earth and it's not so we can eat. Let's go further. Day four. Now, again, this is not a commentary on whole house because some of you are saying, well, we got to have a son in order to have plants. So it's out of order. Again, not a commentary on how it's a commentary on why. So now that we have plants growing, we need seasons. We need winter and summer and spring. We need trees to lose their leaves and we need to start over again. We need cycles of food. So he creates sun, moon and stars. He puts the earth in its orbit and he has it rotating around the sun. He has the moon rotating. He has everything working so that we have seasons, cycles of food. And then what's his assessment of day four? Verse 14 through verse 18, when all of this is done, when there's a sun, a moon and stars and the earth is cycling, it was good. It's getting there. It's getting there. But this isn't it. Keep going. Check. This is good. Now, day five. We need companions. And I know most of you listening probably have some dog in the room that is a great comfort to you or a cat. And animals form a great purpose of our life. For some of us, they are a source of food. Some of us choose not that. That's fine. But for some of us, they are a source of food. Some of us, they are a labor. For many pe pe years, they plowed fields because they had the strength of animals to help them. They are our companions in this life. We need them and they need us. And it's a beautiful relationship. And so Heavenly Father fills the earth with animal life not only for our comfort and our protection, um, our source of food, um, so all those things coming together. He fills the earth with animals, many of whom just make our lives better. They comfort us. They bring us peace. Now, when all of this is happening, we've got an earth full of animals, full of plants, a cycle, We've got winter, summer. We've got just everything working. What's his assessment? And notice he says it twice in day five. His assessment of all of the work. First in verse 21. And then in verse 25. It was good. Now, this is where we get to a sacred moment. The work of creation belonged to Jehovah for days one, two, three, four, and five. On day six, it is the Father. Would I be so far out of line to suggest the mother as well? It was the work of heavenly parents to take over creation on day six, we will go down. And I would suggest that it's heavenly parents acting because they say, we're going to make man and woman in our image. In our image meant that it was the work of a male and a female to make man in their image. And they create Adam and Eve. Now we'll save the commentary on how that happened for another day. It's not my point in this video, but they bring life to their children. Now we have Adam and Eve on the earth. Now we're not done with day six. It's not just the creation of two individuals. The command that was given is in verse 28. And I, God, blessed them and said unto them, 
be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. This is not just two individuals happening to be on the same planet. Heavenly Father on day six created a family. He created a family, the first family. He said, be fruitful, multiply the earth, be a family, bring children. Those are his purposes. Now notice how his assessment of the work changes after there's a family on earth. Food we need, rain, rivers, seasons, animals, all of those things were just checks to get to this point. Now he reveals why there's an earth. In his assessment of day six, it changes. Verse 31, I, God, saw everything that I had made, and behold, all things which I had made were very good. He didn't say that on day five, when everything but the family was there. He said it on day six. We have now made an earth capable of his purpose, and that is to create, to protect families. The creation, the coming together of families is very good. Now, may I suggest that is repeated over and over and over again so that Heavenly Father has a chance to emphasize His reason for creating the earth. What are His priorities? This earth was created so that we could create families, family units. They are the secret of happiness. So many scientific studies are coming out today saying family and marriage is the secret of happiness. Children are best raised in a family environment. It is society's greatest secret weapon, strong families. This earth was created for families. Now, I know for some of you that's a very sore subject, but let's, let's embrace that the greatest source of happiness is family. I recognize that the greatest source of pain can also be family, but the greatest source of happiness is family, and we are here to create family. Now, he's going to take that up a notch. Let's go to the very first section of the Doctrine and Covenants. The very first revealed, not sequential. If you turn to section one, you will notice it is not the first section received. It was received an hour, a year and a half after the church was organized. It was received in response to the question, should we publish the revelations that Joseph has received? The answer was yes, and put this first. In verse six of section one, the Lord calls section one his preface. But the very first section received, the first revelation received in our day by a prophet of our dispensation was section two. It was given to a 17 year old boy. This is when Moroni appears to Joseph Smith and quotes the Old Testament and gives him a better version of what we find in these, the last two verses of the Old Testament. This is Malachi chapter four. The Old Testament ends with this prophecy. Moroni comes and clarifies it. And that is section two. The first section of our dispensation said, I'm gonna send you Elijah. Now tell me what Elijah is gonna allow us to do. The whole point of Elijah coming is to seal families. I'm going to send you Elijah. He's going to bring the sealing keys so that you can seal families. Now listen to what our very first section, the very first revelation in our day, Joseph, Moroni to Joseph Smith said, section two. Verse three, after promising that he would send Elijah, he says, were it not so, if I don't send Elijah, if you don't receive Elijah to seal families, the whole earth would be utterly wasted at his coming. I'm just gonna let you think about that for a second. The Lord says, 
if we don't create and then seal families, this whole earth was a waste. That is a heavy doctrine. And I would suggest to you every time you hear the presentation of the endowment, he is repeating that message. If we don't create, if we don't create an environment so that we can create and then seal families for eternity, this whole earth was a waste. May I look you in the eye as best I can and say that for me, in my life, if my family does not end up sealed, created, brought together, raised in an environment of love where we choose to be together and sealed for eternity, I will consider my life to have been a waste. Everything else I did was a waste. I know that's kind of a dramatic, I think there were valuable things I did. But if we don't make and create eternal families, this whole earth was a waste. Now, those of you who are struggling with that family, you hold out hope. You trust that things will work out. You trust that this earth still has a purpose for you. And maybe it's in the spirit world. Maybe it's a few years away. But I promise that if we trust Heavenly Father, all of those opportunities are going to come. I recognize that for some of you, that is a painful thought. But the truth is, it's still a truth. It means we need to eventually someday, before we walk into the celestial kingdom, have created an eternal family that could then continue for eternity. So you hold out hope. But again, the doctrine is the purpose of this earth is to create families. The Lord will kind of hint at that again, again in the Doctrine and Covenant. In section 49, when Lehman Copley, a former shaker, was supposed to take a message to the shakers and to teach them, correct some of their doctrine, the Lord revealed section 49, saying, hey, some things are wrong with your doctrine and we need to correct them. And one of the things that was wrong is they did not believe in marriage, which is why I don't believe there's any more shakers on the earth today. If you don't believe in marriage, your whole organization is kind of going to kind of disappear. But they didn't believe in marriage. And the Lord was sending Lehman Copley to correct that, in which he says the following. Again, verily I say unto you, that whoso forbiddeth to marry is not ordained of God. For marriage is ordained of God unto man. Wherefore, it is lawful that he should have one wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Now notice the emphasis here at the end of verse 16. And all of this, marriage, family, all of this, that the earth might answer the end of its creation. See, there it is again. The purpose of the earth, the, the earth is going to answer the ends of its creation, and that was to create and then seal for eternity families. Our communities do best when our families are strong. Now, let me add one more. Let me take you on a scriptural journey. And this is where we're going to get to the symbol. We're getting to that symbol of a book full of names sitting on an altar. But let me introduce it a different way. Let's talk about the restoration of the priesthood. Back on May 15th of 1829, the Aaronic priesthood was restored. Joseph and Oliver were translating the Book of Mormon. It talked about baptism. They realized they'd never been baptized. They went out to the banks of the Susquehanna River, and John the Baptist appears and confers upon them the Aaronic priesthood. Later, Peter, James, and John will come and restore the Melchizedek priesthood. But listen to the prayer that John the Baptist uttered when he restored the Aaronic priesthood. According to Joseph's account in section 13, the official scriptural account, he said, 
Upon you, my fellow servants, and in the name of Messiah, I confer the priesthood of Aaron, which holds the keys of the ministering of angels, and the, of the gospel of repentance and of baptism of, by immersion for the remission of sins. And this shall never be taken again from the earth until. Now that was Joseph's word, until. And I think it was 100% correct. And no way do I want to suggest that Joseph heard the wrong word. Because Joseph heard the word until, meaning this priesthood is not going away until the sons of Levi do offer an offering unto the Lord in righteousness. And notice it's again, the sons of Levi do offer again an offering unto the Lord in righteousness. So again, that's why we believe that there will be no apostasy. The Lord is not going to let this church go into apostasy. The priesthood will not be taken again from the earth until the sons of Levi offer this offering in righteousness. That's the word until. Joseph said until. Now, may I suggest that there are other doctrines, other points to be made. Not, it's not a competition. I don't no way want to suggest that Oliver heard the right word and Joseph heard the wrong word. In no way. Joseph heard the word until. And I'm sure that John the Baptist meant until. So it's very clear that the priesthood is not going to be taken away until. But Oliver uses a different word there. And the reason I emphasize it is the Lord is going to use that same word later on in the Doctrine and Covenants. Again, I don't, I'm not trying to suggest that Oliver, that Joseph heard the wrong word. It is true that it's until, but Oliver heard a different word. If you go to the Pearl of Great Price, to the Joseph Smith history, at the very end of the Pearl of Great Price, where the font changes and it now becomes the writings of Oliver Cowdery. Letters that Oliver wrote under the direction of Joseph Smith have been included in the Pearl of Great Price. In the second to last paragraph, again, after the font changes, so these are Oliver's words, in the second to last paragraph, which has not been numbered, you hear Oliver's account of John the Baptist coming. Now notice a different word. Oliver says it this way, Upon you, my fellow servants, in the name of Messiah, I confer this priesthood and this authority. So far, we're pretty similar. But now Oliver adds, under the, remember, Oliver wrote this under the direction of Joseph, which shall remain upon the earth, not until the offering is made, but that the offering can be made. Now, that's a significant addition. The priesthood was given so that we can make this offering. And it won't go away until we do. The priesthood was given so that we can make an offering. So that the sons of Levi may yet offer an offering unto the Lord in righteousness. That was Oliver's word, was that. And I think both are significant. The, the priesthood will not be go, taken away until, and the priesthood was restored that we may offer this offering. So let's see if we can add to our understanding of what this offering is. Now, allow me to say, I recognize what prophet seers and revelators and church historians and other authors have said in the past about what this offering is. I'm very aware of Joseph Fielding Smith's writings, Elder McConkie's writings, and I don't in any way want to contradict that. Who am I to contradict that? I simply want to point out what Joseph Smith in the Doctrine and Covenants indicated is at least part of that offering. May not be the whole thing, but is at least part of that offering. So allow me to just stick with Joseph's interpretation. Let's build up to it and start in section 84 of the Doctrine and Covenants with the Oath and Covenant of the priesthood. Now, in section 13, there hadn't been rest Melchizedek priesthood restored, so we only mentioned sons of Levi. But we're going to add a couple pieces to the puzzle in 84 when we talk about the oath and covenant of the priesthood. Now that Melchizedek priesthood has been restored, we're going to add to sons of Levi. So in section 84, verse 31, prior to now, we typically consider the oath and covenant starting in verse 33, 
But verse 41, we add to our understanding. He says, Wherefore I said unto you concerning the sons of Moses, for the sons of Moses and also the sons of Aaron. So it's not just an Aaronic priesthood offering. It's a Melchizedek priesthood offering. It's a all the priesthood offering. The sons of Moses, that's Melchizedek, and also the sons of Aaron, or Levi, that's Aaronic, shall offer an acceptable offering. So we're back to the same idea, but we've added Melchizedek. It's a Melchizedek offering, not just a Aaronic offering. It's the Melchizedek priesthood and the Aaronic priesthood. So could we say that the two words apply again, that the Melchizedek priesthood will not be taken from the earth until the offering is made, and that the priesthood, both Melchizedek and Aaronic, were restored so that the offering could be made. That's significant. The other thing we add from verse 31 is the offering has to be acceptable. And then one more. Notice where the offering will be given. In the temple. Not out front. In the temple. The Melchizedek and Aaronic priesthood was restored so that we can offer an acceptable offering in the temple. Now let's get to Joseph Smith's interpretation, at least a part of that interpretation. Turn with me to section 128, Doctrine and Covenants section 128. If you're familiar with 128, Joseph is revealing the work for the dead. How are we going to save the dead? Well, it's going to involve Elijah's keys. It's going to involve families. We're going to save and seal families who have passed on. Now, notice the subject of the priesthood comes up towards the end of the section. So the Lord says in verse 24, Behold, the great day of the Lord is at hand. And who can abide the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appeareth? For he is like refiner's fire and fuller soap, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of sil silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. There it is. We're connected to that same idea. The sons of Levi and their offering. But notice what we add. Notice Joseph Smith's therefore. Speaking of the offering of the sons of Levi, therefore, let us, therefore, as a church and as a people and as Latter-day Saints. So may I suggest that the offering is not being made only by those who hold office in the priesthood. The point here is that the priesthood was restored so that we as a people could make this offering. We as Latter-day Saints are going to make the offering. It's not a handful of Aaronic priesthood holders or Melchizedek priesthood holders. It's we as a people have the power and the ordinances of the priesthood so that we could make this offering. Therefore, let us as a church, as a people, and as Latter-day Saints offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. So it has to be righteous. It has to be acceptable. We're going to get to acceptable. But let us offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Now listen to Joseph Smith's interpretation of that fulfillment. I think we're on good ground to say this is how Joseph Smith saw that. Let us and let us present in his holy temple when it is finished, a book containing the records of our dead, which shall be worthy of all acceptation. If we put all those together, Joseph seems to be suggesting that the whole reason the priesthood was restored is so that we could present to the Lord a book containing the records of all the sealings that we have performed for the human family, all the families that have been sealed. Here are the records, Lord. We have sealed the families. Now think about 
the last symbol, one of the last symbols you see before you present yourself to the Father. The symbol of a book containing names on an altar. Our offering to God is going to be that we have sealed the families. We have performed the work and it has to be acceptable. May I suggest that the book's not acceptable? Not that the book is bad or wrong, it's just incomplete. Are there people in your family whose names are not yet in the book? Are there ancestors whose names are not yet in the book? Are there current members of your family? Are there grandchildren and children whose names are not in the book? It is my life's mission to present to the Lord my family up and down. My family's work has been completed. That I have done all that I can do as a child and as a father, grandfather. I have done all that I can do to fill this book with their names. And I now present, I make you my offering and place it on the altar that I have done all that I could do to fill this book with the names of my family. And I'm ready to report. If I cannot present that book, if I cannot present that I have done all in my power, both up and down to complete that book, then may I suggest, in my opinion, my whole life, was a waste. Now I needed to go pay. I needed to earn a living so that we could eat. I needed to grow food. And that was a good thing that I did. Getting an education, having a job, providing for my family, putting food on their table. That was a good thing, but it doesn't, it wasn't necessarily the purpose of my life. The purpose of my life was to create and then seal that eternal family so that it lasts for eternity. C.S. Lewis once suggested that you can measure the value of a thing by its lifespan. Now you, and let me ask you, how long will you spend at any job? How long will you, did you spend in school? How long will you play the sport that you love? Or how long will your hobby last? How long will the institutions of this world last? And how long will your family last? The things that we do that are of the most importance are the things that last the longest. Therefore, to make an eternal family is the most important thing that I can do. And I live every day to put names in that book. The way I treat my children, the way I treat my spouse, the reason I go to work, the reason I do these videos is so that we can present that book as worthy as we can, as acceptable as we can to the Lord, saying we have completed the work and sealed the families. Then I expect him to use the word he used regarding the restoration and our ability to do this. When he said the work is coming, he said that this work was a wonder and marvelous. I want to present my book. I want to present the portion of the book that I have worked my whole life to complete to the Lord. And I want him to say, it is marvelous. And that's why we created the earth. I bear you my testimony and plead with you to do your part to complete the book. Get the names belonging to your family up and down in that book so that we can make an offering as a church to the Lord and present that book with names on his altar in his house to him. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.